And then finally, although still not here, maybe because she can't find her notes, uh, is Hilary Wainwright, um, who I'll introduce now as well, who is editor of Red Pepper, uh, one of the famous authors, of course, of Beyond the Fragments, uh, with Sheila Robotham and uh, Lynn Siegel, uh, really the pioneering book. Uh, of the attempt to go beyond the fragmented movements uh, of the 1970s to create a new type of politics, uh, one that would build in the movement dynamics while transcending the uh, limits of uh, Leninism and uh, especially the IS Socialist Workers' Party that they were all part of briefly in the 1970s. That book has just been reprinted and is as fresh in many ways as it was when it was first written. Um, uh, Hillary, of course, uh, has written a great deal on the Labour Party in Britain, um, on really it existing as two parties in one, as she wrote in the 1980s. Uh, the party that threw up the Benite attempt to democratize the party, on the theme of if you can't democratize the Labour Party, you can't democratize the British state. Uh, she worked in the Greater London Council and the famous popular planning unit before it was abolished by Mrs. Thatcher. Um, and she knows that wing of the party and that threw up Jeremy Corbyn suddenly as its leader in a remarkable kind of back to the future moment. Uh, that happened uh, this summer in, in the Labour Party. And the fact that, you know, the most left-wing, the most radical, but also the most uh, uh, modest and therefore, in a way, least known MP on the British left has become leader of the par a party that has always deferred to those institutions, always deferred to the monarchy, to, you know, the whole kind of um, <clears throat> rule of West of, of Whitehall and... And, and, and the Anglo-American sort of relationship and the whole imperial um, <clears throat> history of Britain, you know, is is absolutely awesome. And we're still a bit kind of in awe. And so, uh, you know, we can't quite, you know, even John MacDonald, the, the, the shadow chancellor, often says in speeches, I have to sort of pinch myself every morning and think, is this, am I sure it's not a dream, you know? Um, so uh, this is a good occasion, particularly after Halloween night, to sort of sober down <laughs> and, and, and sort of, you know, assess, and with your help, really, what, what are the kind of balance of forces. And it's really good to be doing this in the context of um, two uh, speeches by two really um, insightful comrades from, from front lines, such as um, Greece and Portugal. So I thought I'd begin just to kind of um, give you a sense of just what an extraordinary moment it is, just by giving you a very quick scenario of, of what happened, and then some explanation of, of how it happened, and then some description of the kind of forces at work now and the dilemmas that we face in order to get your kind of advice and feedback. <clears throat> so this is a story that John MacDonald particularly tells. Uh, so it all began in, I don't know, I can't remember the dates exactly, but after the election defeat of Labour, which actually, I mean, it was a defeat, you know, a serious defeat. That morning was so depressing. I was actually in Athens, but, you know, which was, so I was hearing the night before, you know, all the kind of forces up against Syriza. And then I was thinking, well, you know, tonight something really good's going to happen. Well, I was hoping. And then the election results came in and, you know, everybody was just so shocked. Because by the end of the campaign, Ed Miliband was beginning to, to find his voice and beginning to talk strongly about um, inequality and how, to, how uh, Labour was going to fight inequality. And was, he was beginning to, to become more, more, more belligerent around austerity, influenced a bit by the, the boldness of the SNP, the Scottish Nationalists, which I'll come to later. Anyway, uh, about, you know, after he, he resigned very sort of honourably, very courageously, um, and, but immediately the sort of ghouls of Peter Mandelson and Tony Blair started, you know, the day after, you know, it was just absolutely disgusting. Basically saying, I told you so, you know, the, the Labour Party had become too left-wing, only we, only our, we and our sort of coterie 
can actually um, achieve electoral victory. So let's get back to how we ran the Labour Party. And so then you had the, the kind of candidates of lining up. And if they weren't Blairite, they were all pretending to be Blairite. So the most left-wing candidate, uh, Andy Burnham, launched his campaign in a kind of um, office of a, a city consultant, you know, in the, at the heart of the, 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 the city of London, and talked about how it was really important to, to see entrepreneurs as the, as the kind of leaders of today, the hero of today, and went on like this. And then a, a kind of Blairite who, who himself, herself was, you know, positively sort of saying we need to go back to the days of Blair and Manderson in terms of what we do. They all kind of lined up. And the, the, what was left of the left, the activists on the ground were desperately tweeting and sort of emailing. The few, there were hardly any, there were about three or four left MPs uh, left. Although I have to say, we'll come to this later, partly as a result of changes that Ed Miliband introduced into the apparatus of the Labour Party, some new Labour MPs had come in because he ended the sort of patronage of the Labour leadership, i.e. New Labour, Tony Blair, etc., and enabled local con constituency parties to actually you know, choose the candidates they wanted. And constituency parties had become, in ways I'll describe a bit later, had become more radical, more left-wing, and so there were a few younger MPs, but they hadn't yet become fully integrated into the sort of Labour left group in Parliament. So there was this meeting that took place you know, to, dis to respond to all this outside pressure, out that pressure from Labour Party activists, of three um, Labour, Labour left MPs, uh, John McDonnell, Diane Abbott and Jeremy Corbyn, and then two or three um, other sort of left veterans who, who turned up to the meeting to, to sort of discuss what on earth to do. So they sat there in, you know, in the midst of this, you know, I don't know how many of you have been to the House of Commons, but it's totally kind of, it totally sort of dominated the, the kind of, talking about the weight of tradition, the weight of the past, you know, you know, being kind of statues of Winston Churchill and, you know, all the kind of pomposity of the British state and, and the sort of memories of British imperialism, well, still active in some ways. So um, there they were. And so, you know, John McDonnell, who was chair of the campaign group, said, well, you know, Comrades, we, we, we probably do have to stand somebody, you know, we do need a voice in this campaign, if only just to kind of hold the flag up, keep the flame burning, you know, this sort of, this sort of talk. Um, so who's going to do it? I, this is John McDonald talking, you know, I've done it twice and got nowhere uh, and I've had a heart attack two years ago. And, you know, this was a contest where Tony Blair hadn't just defeated the left organisationally, but had absolutely demonised, with the help of the press, absolutely demonised the left. So it was a deep hostility. So, in, and it affected not just politics, but also anything. You know, if you were at all stroppy, you know, in your union or in your institution, you know, you were kind of, you know, it was almost a Cold War McCarthyite mm -hmm. atmosphere, actually, really. So, you know, John McDonnell had really suffered under that. Then Diane Abbott, who's, you know, who's a very feisty black MP, very, you know, got quite a media profile, you know, quite, you know, good at, at, at sort of dealing with public platforms. But she said, look, I've done it too. I really can't. There's no point in me doing it again. So there was Jeremy kind of, you know, beginning to go, oh, my God. And so eyes went to Jeremy. So, you know, OK, Jeremy, really, it is your turn, you know. So Jeremy is a totally, like, unassuming, kind of very modest, person who, who's very, you know, he's, he's very um, principled. It's not that he's, his modesty doesn't mean that he's not courageous. He takes up every single campaign. And if you just know that if you've got, um, uh, if you're working with an asylum seeker who's got real problems and you need some public profile, you, you know, you contact Jeremy. He's just so responsive to campaigns that have got no direct connection to the Labour Party, um, but are from people suffering injustice and oppression. So he's got that kind of, you know, commitment to struggle. In fact, I maybe quote just something he said that's so clear about what he stands for, which I'll, I'll come to a bit later about his character, but just to imagine this scene. Um, you know, and here you've got this guy who, who doesn't see himself. He's not got no ambition whatsoever. He's almost an anti-politics person in that sense of sort of, you know, the, the whole career structure of the Labour Party just leaves him completely cold. Um, 
uh, he totally, um, he never over, over, overestimates his own power. He says, I always try to encourage people in what they're trying to achieve, he says. MPs can't do everything themselves, we're not gods. But if an MP says, I will support you, that's probably a help to the campaign. So that's just his whole approach. He was like a kind of shop steward in Parliament, a kind of resource to the movement. So, okay, so this wasn't his priority, you know, to sort of get, you know, to be involved in some kind of inner party campaign. So he kind of said, well, yeah, I guess, I suppose so. I suppose it's my turn, yeah. So, <laughs> so here you had a, somebody who was de definitely having a leadership struggle sort of thrust upon him rather than him having any sort of ambitions. And that, you know, that, I think it also shows in his character, you know, he doesn't sort of, you know, bear himself in a sort of pompous kind of way. He doesn't, he doesn't feel like a, a politician. Anyway, so there he was, you know, he'd, he'd, he'd eventually been persuaded to do it. And then they had to get 40 MPs to, to sign up. And, you know, they got these younger MPs on the left, so it's maybe t creeping up to 20. Um, then through r appealing to various ex-lefties, appealing to their conscience, you know, come on, Margaret Becky, you know, people who are now thoroughly part of the apparatus, but obviously felt a bit guilty, maybe, you know. Um, <laughs> they, they sort of signed up, you know, to give the left a voice, you know, thinking, well, OK, they can sort of shout a bit, you know, but, you know, it's not going to make any difference. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, like, it, the, the final deadline was midnight, oh, no, midnight, midday, you know, and the, the Big Ben was about to strike, and they were in the, the, the whip, you know, the office of the, the Parliamentary Party, and, and they got up to, to, to I think, um, 30, they were sort of four short, anyway, and, um, and I think one or two people had said, well, if you get up to 30 or something, we'll, we'll, we'll sign up. So there was John McDonnell, and he says, you know, he was almost in tears. He was kneeling before these, these four MPs <laughs> saying, look, please sign, you know. And just as Big Ben was about to, you know, or was beginning to ring in its slow way, he, they managed to reach the 40. So then, you know, that's still, if everybody would, you know, we'd all be um, sort of very happy, you know, Jeremy's on the ballot, Wolfie, you know, sort of thing. And then, um, uh, then there, there was a hustings, you know, when, when all the speakers, um, would, would, all the candidates would speak. And, and this was in a place called Nuneaton, which was a, a marginal seat, uh, you know, the sort of place which Tony Blair and Manson would be really targeting. Um, and um, so all, all the audience were, were sort of these so-called kind of marginal voters. Um, and so, you know, at the, but at the hustings, you know, Jeremy really sort of shone, you know, and the media said he shone. And it was through this, what he then became the slogan of the campaign, straight talking, honest politics. And he would just answer questions directly, he would just say what he believed, you know, about trident, about austerity, you know, defining his campaign very much both in terms of being a campaign for a party that was an anti-austerity party, that was an anti-nuclear party, but also explaining a new politics, saying, you know, he actually believed in a different kind of politics. He, he believed that the whole political system had got completely out of touch with ordinary people. You know, he, he'd been a constituency, you know, an MP, and, and a and very, very um, respected constituency MP who had a surgery that's, you know, meeting with his constituents every week, you know, taking their problems. So he was really close to people's problems and that kind of shaped his whole language and all the kind of examples he gave. Um, anyway, so gradually momentum, you know, built up um, and then, you know, you had Unite, the biggest union supporting him. And then he started having rallies that were just unbelievable. You know, the press would, would go thinking, oh, you know, we're going to go and see a few sort of typical old lefties that we all recognise, you know, and a few dogs, and, you know, that'll be, you know, that'll be it, you know, maybe they'll have brought their friends and family, but it'll all be very typical sort of old left, you know, all the old trots and so on, selling their newspapers and, and so on. And, um, and, 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 and uh, their books. <laughs> yeah. And uh, anyway, so, but then, but actually it was full of these young people, and young people climbing in through the windows to try and get in, you know, sort of overflows and just, you know, and actually, I, I was talking to one journalist during the campaign, and after the interview, he said, he said as we were going out, he said, Hillary, you know, Jeremy Corbyn, he's really, he's really broken our template. You know, we, <laughs> we couldn't, cannot understand what's going on. So while they, the media, the kind of more honest journalists, could not understand, 
Tony Blair and Manson were completely beside themselves. Tony Blair actually made a speech saying that people are following their heart, not their head, and they need a heart transplant. <laughs> you know, so, you know there was, there, uh, in the, every time he would do this, he'd make these kind of speeches, and Manson too, you know, support for Jeremy Corbyn sort of escalated. <laughs> so that way the campaign sort of just grew and grew. And so by the end, you know, and we, but still, you know, I remember going to the rally the night before, and nobody was like, kind of counting their chickens. Everybody was slightly nervous, you know, because things can go wrong, as as did with the election before that we did think we'd we'd won the general election. But anyway, so the the result finally comes, and Jeremy's won a kind of overwhelming majority of over nearly sixty percent. You know, evidently the biggest majority of of any Labour leader. Um, and he had uh, over 50% of the members and rather around 70% of supporters, and I'll explain this in a bit, but only 10% of MPs. Now, it's important just to sort of quickly say something about the, the, the rules of the leadership because they did, they kind of reflected a sort of peculiar dialectic of, of closure and, and open, openness. And, so in, it, there was a big campaign to democratise the Labour Party led by Tony Benn in the 70s and 80s. Uh, and, you know, it was reacted to by the, the British establishment in, in, the, in a way that, you know, I tried to convey at the beginning, you know, a sort of political elite that assumed, and this in the, it was in the Labour Party too, that it had the right to rule and that the whole idea of ordinary party activists having any say was just completely, you know, overthrowing parliamentary democracy and, you know, was really the end of the world as we knew it. And so, the, the, you know, Ben was subject to the most vicious attacks and, and so on, but, it, and in the end, it did, it was defeated by a sort of alliance of, of the parliamentary leadership, the media, and a, and a kind of section of the, of the trade union, more right-wing trade union, trade union bureaucracy. But it did lead to one change, which was a change in how the leader should be elected, which did lead to a move beyond it being just MPs, which it used to be in the past, to being what was called an electoral college of unions, MPs, uh, and party members, with a strong bias towards MPs, and the unions voting as a block. Now, um, and, and actually throughout the party, the unions' participation in the party was mainly what's called the block vote, where, where the unions would participate, you know, on the basis of their affiliation, you know, which would be millions, not necessarily reflecting active trade union members. So union leaders would get up, you know, even if their delegation was split on, say, Trident or, or public ownership or something radical, the union leader would get up and say, you know, four million votes for, for his opinion, which was usually the right of that sort of split, but it was sometimes the left under Ben, there were moments when the left uh, in the unions did extremely well. So, so Blair, in his kind of whole attempt to kind of crush the left, and it really was like crushing, like a sort of a fly, trying, you're really trying to crush the left, um, he tried to destroy uh, union power. And um, in the end, he, he accepted this college, it was a sort of typical kind of compromise. But um, gradually, he was trying all the time to sort of erode the link between the unions and the Labour Party. Um, you know, not always successfully, but in the end, end under Miliband, after quite a sort of artificially um, sort of exaggerated row over the role of the unions in a, a local um, selection campaign, uh, Ed sort of compromised, and in exchange for um, reducing the power of the MPs, the um, power of the unions as a block was reduced, and it, it was it, instead of them voting for the leader as a block, they had to vote on the basis of individual members. So this special category was created called supporters, which was a bit like a sort of primary sort of device. So it was opening up. Oh my god! Oh my god! <laughs> it was opening up the. Um, the um, vote to, to ordinary, you know, to punters who were not party activists. And interestingly, here, it, it was it was a classic. As Andrew Murray, you must read Andrew Murray's article in the Socialist in the Bullet because it describes a lot of the detail of what I'm talking about, which I'll have to skip very quickly now. Um, and he says, you know, this was the you know the most classic example of 
um, you know, how intended consequences never have the outcome that, 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 that is intended. Because, you know, while Blair, he had a sort of contempt for activists, you know, he just thought of them as totally unrepresented and complete loonies, you know, wild-eyed, sort of unrepresentative people who didn't have families and, you know, didn't mow their lawns and all this kind of thing. And um, anyway, and, but the ordinary people who did mow their lawns and did have families were, you know, moderate, you know, people who would never vote for the left. But actually, this opening up suddenly opened it to to generations of people who become steadily disillusioned with New Labour and, and radicalised by experiences like Syriza and the Alta Globalisation Movement, uh, and who, who signed up for this supporting um, this supporting subscriber, supporting, um, sorry, I'm talking Red Pepper, supporting membership um, uh, category to vote, including a lot of people who'd left during the Iraq war and came back with the thought of supporting Jeremy, who'd actually been one of the leaders of the movement against the war. So just very quickly, if I may, um, uh, what explains this extraordinary turn from a, a, a left, in the Labour Party, which is very weak and was certainly weak at the beginning of Jeremy's campaign, and in a certain sense, in a parliamentary sense, still is, and that's going to be an important factor um, to this kind of amazing success. And um, Andrew Murray, in this bullet article, documents this in some detail. But I mean, the basic points of, on the one hand, um, the uh, sort of hollowing out of New Labour, which goes back to firstly the, the, the um, Iraq war and, and Tony Blair's um, not just complicity but sort of you know leading role in that um, with Bush and, and, and so on and his covering up of the evidence around uh, evidence of mass uh, weapons of mass destruction you know all of which has been coming out there's been a lot of you know what you could call sort of glasnost of sort of people investigating um, what really happened both in that and also the minor strike. and um, So that was an aspect of following up. Then the impact of the financial crash was, was crucial because the whole uh, strategy of Gordon Brown uh, was, was basically the idea that, and, and this in a way is like a fundamental feature of social democracy taken to an extreme by New Labour, is that you, know, you let capitalism basically do what it likes. And in this instance, you, know, you completely deregulate the city um, and so, you know, the, the kind of financialization of, of capital was sort of running riot. And then the, 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 the taxation, fairly minimal taxation, but the taxation of the, of the profits um, did lead to sort of, you know, funding of the, of the, of the welfare state and of um, the nationalized industries and so on. And so, you know, all that went, you know, the cash cow in effect was sort of drained. Uh, and had, had, had effectively died, uh, and so there was not the money to keep public institutions going, or or even to fund properly the um, well, what, what, I don't know what properly means the sort of outsourcing and um, subcontracting to the private sector. So you had a combination of the constant failure of privatisation, you know, big high-profile failures like the Olympic Games, you know, the security company that had been subcontracted to do it, do that completely failed to, to provide people to, to provide security for the, to the fun, for the Olympic Games. So you turn up, I went to the, the uh, paraplegic, you know, the disabled Olympic Games, and, you know, we, you were sort of searched by, by army officers, you know, who were kind of brought on to do the basic kind of security. Um, you know, water privatisation, you know, was, was completely failing, so in a very, very wet country, um, you know, there was water shortages. The railways, which is the biggest sort of scandal, were, were getting so inefficient that, that prices meant, you know, most ordinary people just couldn't travel unless they booked sort of months in advance. Um, and, you know, the trains were always late, the loos were always, you know, closed. And, you know, so there's, there's a sort of real, you know, hatred of privatisation. And in a way, all this helped, this particular aspect helped to feed into the fact that that now public ownership is really quite popular, and that's been a key aspect of Jeremy's um, campaign. So you have this hollowing out of new labour, the kind of you know, disillusion with um, austerity and seeing through austerity, so that the whole anti-austerity aspect of Jeremy's campaign got real sort of resonance. And then on the other hand, you've got this growth of a, 
a new generation of activists influenced by the alter globalization movement and so on, and by the consequences of mass education and, and so on, and maybe parents from 68 and so on, but who were immensely confident and, 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 and angered by the injustice of it all, but they translated their anger not into, you know, we must join the local Labour Party and pass a resolution, but hang on a minute, you know, we've got boots, we've got all these companies that are avoiding their tax, that are, that are exploiting uh, workers in the third world. Let's just get on there, let's just occupy those companies, which they did in very imaginative ways, turning, you know, boots, which is a particular, it's, it's, its leaders are, are particularly strong, uh, or scandalous tax evaders, into hospitals, you know, so... You'd, you'd, you'd go past the Boots, which is a high street shop, and there'd be, you know, an occupation. Plus, the shop had been turned into a hospital with people dressed up as nurses, and, you know, and, and every local paper, you know, had this on the front page. So it became, you know, tax evasion, dealing with tax evasion, being like a sort of a, a very a kind of occupation of a few very nerdy, very worthy people, and a few MPs who'd meet in a committee room, kind of, you know drawing up plans that just got nowhere and suddenly it was this this big issue a bit like the impact of occupy suddenly inequality tax evasion injustice was like a kind of major popular issue but that really shifted the the, the kind of agenda in a significant way and the similarly with climate change you know you had climate camp people occupying um, land in Heathrow that was going to be made into a third runway. So you had this generation of people who could see that they had a kind of power by, by refusing to reproduce the status quo and by, by, by actually acting transformatively, you know, to, to show that there was an alternative. Uh, and these people were also very affected by the indignados and what was happening in Portugal and Greece and, and Spain. And in a way, the, the sort of effect of, of, of what's been happening in Europe has meant a very significant internationalisation of the so-called labour force, or really basically the precarious uh, reserve army in London. You know, you, you walk the streets and you, 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 know, you just hear Spanish and Italian and, and Greek. And, and Polish. You know, and Polish, you know. It's, it's, and so, so in a way, they were all part of this kind of movement. Um, so the, that's the nature of the move. So the movement that, that led to, to Corbyn's victory was very, very hybrid. It included Labour Party you know, people and some people who, who were highly brilliant organisers within the party and who'd been part of Ben's campaign. But then this new generation of young people who'd also played an important part in Scotland in the, um, in the campaign for independence, which, which wasn't simply about nationalism. It was about... You know, the referendum suddenly offered this opportunity of a different society. Okay. Um, you know, uh, uh, which which then became the um, the basis of this very strong independence campaign, which we can come on to lay, later. Um, so you had a movement which wasn't. It was also not. You weren't asked for your party card. So there were a lot of Green Party members in it. A lot of anarchists. A lot of people who who you know were just you know were so thrilled that you had they had a voice. In Jeremy, and they they weren't sectarian about the Labour Party. They just thought, well, you know, there he is. We must support him. Um, you know, if that means signing up to the Labour Party, okay, fine. You know, so you did it. Um, so that's the kind of campaign that, that that produced his victory. So what now? I'll just skip to, to what now. Just give some on my five minutes maximum um, thoughts. So um, you basically have these people like Blair and Mandelson definitely mobilising, you know, behind the scenes and sometimes more in front, and particularly mobilising the media. I mean, we've all read Stuart Hall and Raymond Williams and, and you know, and Chomsky, and we all know the, the way the media is a sort of key prop of the status quo. But honestly, in Britain, I just, I kind of, every day I, on the radio and the, the newspaper, I just, it's no longer just kind of like a part of the reproductive apparatus of capitalism. It is an agent, you know, it's absolutely a political agent in the attempt to, to crush the left, um, working very closely with the, the, the sort of right-wing MPs who are, are completely in, inconsistent. I mean, <clears throat> they, um, they basically go on about, you know, how, Labour, how Jeremy isn't electorally credible. And then they go out to the media and brief against him. So, 
We know from the past defeats of the Labour Party that what leads to parliamentary defeat, par electoral defeat, is not so much that the party was too left-wing, but that it was divided. And so these, these, these MPs, some of whom have agreed to be part of, um, of Corbyn's cabinet, but it must be just to do with sort of, you know, wanting the, the, the ministerial car and the status, because even at the Labour Party conference, they were sort of just, just he would make a really impressive leader's speech, which really, you know, it was really moving and really could have, and did touch people, you know, people at home, as it were. Um, and, um, you know, and it could have, if it had been allowed to sink in, you know, it could have really helped his, his standing electorally, you know, but I, obviously electoralism isn't the only thing that matters, and I'll come to that. Well, I might not, but... <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so but, but, you know, they were just going out and saying, you know, he shouldn't have said that he disagreed with Trident, you know, that's completely irresponsible. And as, as, as Leah reminded me, you know, the left is far more, is far more um, disciplined about unity, you know, it's far more disciplined about Blair, actually, than the right of being about Corbyn. So there is a real you know, <coughs> undermining of him going on all the time. Um, so <clears throat> what are the counter? So the other thing is that the Labour Party apparatus, now this is kind of a mixed a mixed character because on the one hand it's really important to recognize that winning the Labour Party leadership is not changing the Labour Party. I mean obviously it kind of shapes the old establishment and it's step number one, well an extraordinary step number one. You could say a leap up but maybe two steps, you know. But um but you know the Labour Party itself, particularly the parliamentary party, which has always been the key source of reaction. <coughs> Are, are intact and the apparatus is is mixed because although you know Ed Miliband did make important changes, one was the destruction of leadership sort of patronage and, and actually enabling the constituency parties to have a real say. Um, but still in a way the existence of a right wing parliamentary party gives sort of right wingers in the apparatus, regional organisers and so on who don't like Corbyn or don't agree with his politics, the excuse not to, for example, you know, have open meetings of all these new supporters and MPs and, you know, actually, uh, not MPs, um, members, and um, sort of welcome them and talk to them about what they can do, what give, give party support to, to what's happening in the grassroots. So the apparatus is, 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 not, um, is not necessarily an ally for, for Jeremy, just because he's got office, as it were, within the Labour Party. It doesn't mean he's got really power to change it. Um, I think the, the, the important thing is this movement that has come in behind him. And there it's really important to, um, you know, I'd argue, um, recognise this distinction between two kinds of power. One is, is power as transformative capacity, the kind of power to do things, to change things, because of your, your position in society as reproducing society, and therefore a, a potential to, to refuse and to change the kind of power we saw with UK Uncut and, and the young people that have been taking direct action. So there's that power and how that can be mobilised. And then the sort of power of domination associated normally with the power of government. And that's sort of represented through the Labour Party and the, the uh, you know, hope for electoral victory. But in a way, th there needs to be that exercise of transformative capacity for, for there to be the kind of popular self-confidence that leads people to vote for a radical a radical leader and then you need a process of harvesting those votes but the danger now is that a section of the 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 movement that's been created in the aftermath of the victory is really trying to simply draw people into the electoral machine and not thinking how to resource these movements, how the party can become a resource for transformative capacity. So, you know, and that transformative capacity is not just about creating the, the radical consciousness that could lead to electoral victory, but also, you know, as we've been discussing in the last few days, preparing the way for transforming the state, you know, the public sector workers who could, with the communities, actually uh, impose democratic control over the state, the public sector, and so on. So that is a crucial kind of thing. I mean, the other things that are going, you know, that are in, in favour of Corbyn is what's happening in the unions, that 
sections of the unions are becoming, or under New Labour, became more and more political in the absence of a of a political uh, party that was supporting their their cause, you know, supporting the public sector and so on. They themselves became political, which is a key kind of break from the old division between industrial relations and politics, which underpinned the old kind of moderate um, power structure of the Labour Party. So, you know, you get unions really becoming involved in community action, uh, actually deploying groups like, you know, they employed um, UK Uncut people because they could see that the power of acting on a brand is 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 a crucial complement supplement to acting at industrially at the workplace so they've absorbed the kind of lessons of this direct action so there's a kind of important alliance there now i must you stop must. Yes. so um <laughs> uh, just to see if there's anything very quick um uh yeah so the, the, there has been now a movement created called momentum to try and you know, it's, it's full of all these um, anarchists and so on. So there's a real chance that it will develop this transformative capacity. But there's a sort of tension in it. So that's going to be a crucial area of, of struggle. Um, and I think I probably better end there. I mean, I think the lessons from Syriza and from Portugal are going to be crucial in developing what has to be a kind of European-wide movement. And in a way, Jeremy's position on Europe is kind of a bit ambiguous and there is now going to be this debate in Britain in this instigated by Cameron on in or out sort of referendum and you know the strategy of a sort of another Europe depends for its credibility on how we work together across this platform so I'll end there Great. sorry Thank it's really sorry